So John's Gospel, starting at verse, uh, chapter 19, starting at verse 17. Carrying his own cross, he, that of course is Jesus, went out to the place of the skull. Here they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign uh, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that is this man's claim to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them. With the undergarments remaining, this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's divide it by lot. Who, who will get it? This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So that's what the soldiers did. Near the cross of, of Jesus stood his mother, his sister... Um, sorry. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to his disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her to his home. If you have your uh, sheets with you, we're in the uh, third part of this uh, series about sayings from the cross, about things that our Lord and Saviour Jesus said while he was hanging on the cross. He had the awareness in these awful moments to look around and to say some profound things to the people that were there in earshot who were so touched by them that they've written them down for us so that we can look at them and spend time with them and think about what they mean, how they figure to our lives in the here and now. And the two verses that we're speaking about today are these last two verses of the reading. Verses 26 and 27 says, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to a woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her to his home. So let's first of all, as we're looking at this passage, think about these uh, two characters, the who of the people that we're thinking about before we come and open up this idea of compassion. Because the compassion is shown between these two people. These two people who uh, uh, had some understanding about each other, they would have met each other at various times, but they find themselves in this um, moment in their lives, their never forgettable moment in their lives, they find themselves together. And not only do they, are they physically together, by what the Lord Jesus says in the passage we read, we find themselves being united in uh, other ways as well. So we're starting with Mary and John. These are the two people that are there at the cross. Jesus' dear mother was perhaps so taken up with his suffering that she could not consider what would become of her, but that he had that in his hand. You see, while she didn't know what her future held, while she watched her son, who she'd had uh, motherly experiences with, but all sorts of other things happening as he grew up and now as he's a, a grown man, as she's standing there, she's wondering perhaps not only all about this, but perhaps she has a moment to consider what's going to happen to her. Will the family support her? W will they look after and care for her in the way that Jesus clearly made sure that she was looked after beforehand? As he, John was, uh, oh, sorry, as Jesus was experiencing the horrific death, he had no other way to provide for his mother. His opportunity to do all those things he would like to have done for Mary uh, have come to an end. He couldn't provide for his mother other than through a friend, which is what he does. He calls a woman 
That's quite a stark thing to say to your mother. He calls a woman from the cross. He doesn't call her mother, not out of any disrespect to her, but perhaps to call her mother would have been too cutting for her at that time. It would have brought all those experiences back to her mind. She's already uh, wounded with grief and to perhaps open that up as well might have been too much. So Jesus directs her to look at John as being her son. You know, sometimes when God removes something from us, it leads to a greater gift or a greater blessing. Things that we thought that we might have done or things that we hoped we would do and suddenly uh, that, that idea gets squashed, that idea uh, gets taken away or, or that's not the right road for us. We sometimes get a bit down about it, a bit upset, a bit perturbed. Uh, I like a life that rain, runs on train tracks. The family aren't here because otherwise you could uh, talk to them at the end and they'd say, you yeah. know. I like a calendar and I like to stick to the times on the calendars and the days on the calendar. And if somebody doesn't do what they usually do on a Monday until Wednesday, I get a little bit upset by it. That's not a Monday activity, that's that, why are we doing it on Wednesday? Uh, that's just my makeup. And sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes it's not a good thing. But you see, God sometimes takes away things that we hold on to tightly because he wants to bless us in other ways. He wants to release our fingers from some things in our lives, not because they're not good for us necessarily, or not because they're not a blessing from him in the past, but because it's time to move on. Because he's got more for us. He's got greater gifts for us. Isaiah 49 and 21 tells us something of this. Then I will say in your heart, who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren, I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left alone. But these, where have they come from? You see, this is the way in which David, when he was fleeing from Saul, provided for his family. He was pushed to the uttermost. He lived in the palace. David had spent time in the, with the king. He'd, helped and been, been responsible for various duties and suddenly the king has turned on him. Suddenly the king doesn't want to know him anymore. In fact, he not only doesn't want to know him, he wants to kill him. And David has to flee. 1 Samuel 23 and 3 says, From there David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I learn from God what God will do for me. David had a compassion for his family. He wanted to make sure they were okay in circumstances that had changed for him. He wanted those things for his family that would bring them those compassionate things that he wanted for them. Jesus showed remarkable confidence in John's obedience. John had a family. John had a home. John had a certain situation. But as they stood watching the Lord Jesus Christ die on the cross in pain and agony, John didn't think twice about what he was going to do. As asked by Jesus to be a mother to his mother, and for her to have him as her son, he, he, didn't, he didn't think anything of it. He got on and did. There was a need and a responsibility Jesus knew he had to pass on. A need in this world, in this age, in this time. As Jesus went on, he needed to sort these matters out. Isaiah 51 and 18 says, Among the, all the children she bore, there was none to guide her. Among all the children she brought up, there was none to take her by the hand. She would have been lonely. But Jesus, even in all this agony, wants to put things right. He loves her and cares for her and wants to meet her need. And if we think back over Mary's life, it hadn't been an easy life. 
Perhaps some of us would think, well, being the mother of the Son of God, it would be simple. All her needs would be met. Everything would have fallen into place just as she wanted it to. She wouldn't have any concerns or worries, but that's not the life that we read about. Back into Luke to read about some of the early lives. In Luke 1, 28 to 31, it tells us, the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. I, I don't know how we might have coped in those circumstances. How that played out in the little village where she lived how awkward that would have been for her family to explain it to the neighbours. How difficult those situations were. How wonderfully blessed she'd been. But yet at the same time she had life to lead. And her life had others of these mixed blessings. In Luke 2, 25a and then through to 27 and 31 it tells us this. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. The, the family had the habit, the good habit of going up to the temple once a year. They, were, they loved to be with God and, and so they went on these rare occasions up to, up to the temple and worshipped together there, the God who they adored. And, and they've gone and while they're there this man Simeon approaches them. Moved by the Spirit, Simeon went into, uh, sorry, she went into the temple uh, courts where he's, well, sorry, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parent brought the child to Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now may, may, you now may dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. This man had been waiting for God's promise. This man had been praying for God's promise. This man wanted to see and had been promised by God that he'd see it before he died. And here it is. How did Mary feel? Did that excite her or worry her? She had plans and purposes for her, for her own son. She had expectations of what that might be and then this man comes and tells her these extra things that she needs to know, this extra revelation of what it's going to be like. The compassion that Jesus shows here at the cross reflects his compassion for us in living and dying and the compassion that also his Father has for us. We only hear Mary's story at the beginning and end of Jesus' story. She's there at the beginning and now she's here at the end. I, I, I wonder how she got on as being the mother of Jesus. I, I wonder how that played out in those years that we don't hear about. I wonder if she worried about where he was and what he was doing. I wonder as people came back and uh, chatted about what they'd seen and, and how it was, uh, how she felt. Was that a blessing to her? Or was that a concern to her? She was a mother like the mothers there are in the church today. Your son disappears off and doesn't come back for a while, you naturally wonder where he is and what he's doing. What's going, on? What's going on? Exodus 20, 12 reminds us about that relationship. It tells us, honour your father and your mother so you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. But there, there is some sense in which we need to honour one another and that's what Jesus does at the cross. His compassion for his mother means he wants to do the right thing. And he honoured his mother by providing somebody who was going to look after her. Somebody that was going to give her a home and care for her. See, the early church were taught the way that a family should behave. In Ephesians 6, 
1 and 3, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Jesus was living proof that this was the right thing to do, to be concerned, to have compassion for his mother and his friend by giving them to each other, by helping them to understand that they had roles in each other's lives, that there was a need for them to help one another through this situation. There was another trip to the temple when his parents lost him. Do you remember that one back in Luke 2? They'd gone up to do the, the things that they annually did at the temple. It was a big deal. They rushed up. They did whatever it was they needed to do. And at the end of it, they, the caravan, the group of people they all went to, with, it's like spring harvest or another such event, they all went home in their, their vehicles and their cars and their camels and their walking, uh, and on the way they realised that he wasn't with them. He'd stayed and been lost. And in Ephesians, uh, Luke 2, 51, it says, he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother treasured these things in, his heart, in her heart. He'd stayed to hear more about God's word. He, he'd stayed to be close to his heavenly father. He'd stayed because that's where he wanted to be. And in her mind, she's thinking about all those things she's heard, all those things she's seen. He has compassion on her. This relationship he's fostering between his friend and his mother puts a great honour upon John and is a testimony to both, Jesus's, uh, both John's wisdom and his faithfulness. Jesus can trust him with his mother. Jesus can trust him to fulfil that duty, that role, that responsibility of being his mother's mother when he was no longer able to do it. Jesus directs him to look upon Mary as his mum. Here at the very end of his earthly life, we see Jesus still exercising uh, love and care. No thought about himself, just concern about those around him. This loving concern is the glory that his death itself reveals most powerfully, since love is in the laying down of his life for us. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. This is the measure of how deep your love is. This is the measure of the... Of the, um, the, the this is the measure of where we should be aiming for. This is the measure of that point that is the pinnacle of love. This is how we know that what love is, that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay our, down our lives for our brothers and sisters. True love is always two-way. And so it is between Mary and John. He did take Mary home with him. And the church history tells us that she lived with him for the rest of her life. He cared for her. He involved her in his home. He treated her like his own mother. So while Jesus is on the cross, in all that pain, in all that situation that he's in, he looks down at his mother and John and shares his compassion with them. And that's the expectation he has for you and I. Because the why of compassion is because that's what Jesus has done for us and therefore it's what we should be doing to others. And we're picking out just three areas of compassion that this morning we're going to think about. You see, compassionate love is supportive. In the here and now, we often find ourselves in need of support. We need a friend just to draw alongside us. It could be a practical support. It could be something that needs doing in our home or around our car or something else. 
it, it could be advice. It could be just drawing alongside us and helping us in the situations we find ourselves in. It often matters less what is said than the fact that we just know they're there for supporting, to support us. Have you been a supporter in that way? Have you helped somebody in that way? Just knowing the sensitivity of perhaps never saying anything at all. Just being available. Just on the end of the phone. Could be a family, a friend or somebody else. But you just give that level of support to, that compassionate love. In Leviticus 25 and 35 says, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner or a stranger so that they can continue to live among you. Now to us that sounds a bit strange, it sounds a bit odd. It says treat your, your family and neighbours like you would foreigners and strangers. But the culture out there was a bit different from ours. And they honoured strangers and foreigners that came. And they did their very best for them. They'd get out the bone china. They'd put away the ordinary tea and get out the posh stuff. They'd leave uh, other people's, uh, or they'd get out people's prize cakes that they've been looking forward to a week. And it's about putting other people first. It's about doing what other people need. Compassion. And we assume that and, and we assume that it's not in our strength, it's in his strength. In Ephesians 4.16 it says, From the whole body, joined and held together with every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in love, as each part does its work. You see, as a church body here in Cow Plain, we can help each other. And that can flow out to the community around us in supportive ways. In ways that help. In ways that meet needs. In the UK in 2019, it can sometimes feel that rather than being a support for us around us, uh, those around us are, are actively seeking to belittle us and bring us harm. It, it seems the world is against us. It, it can feel as if everything's pressing in on us and we don't know where we can get the support that we need. That compassionate support we can share with one another because the Lord Jesus has shared it with us. The world, as described in Micah 3.11, says her leaders grudge for a bri uh, judge for a bribe her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. You could get whatever you wanted. You could get a, a, a judgment that was suitable for you. You could get the right teaching that, that suited your needs, if you paid a price for it. Your future could be read for you in just the way you wanted it if you paid the price. Is that how our world feels to us today? Yet the verse goes on to say, yet they, they look for the Lord's support and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. You see, the world around us presses in on us. The world around us feels as though they don't want to be compassionate. Compassion is weak. Compassionate isn't what we want. We want to be our own person. We, we want to make our own way. We want to do it our way. We want to go and it doesn't matter what we leave behind us. Are we seeking to support one another? If we're in need, do we share our needs with one another so that we can support one another? 
just as Mary and John were to comfort one another. Is that what we do for one another as a church? Compassionate love is a, is a close love. In our family life, we seek to live close, physical or emotionally, to those we love, to share, to be available, to support, as close as our Heavenly Father is to us. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's faithful. He wants us to live lives that bring in glory, but most of all, he wants us to have our, our deep down needs met. He wants us to have fellowship with him, to know him as our loving Heavenly Father, and that's provided for us through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ who we've already spoken about. At that moment he was hanging on that cross and sorting this issue out. These people in front of him that he loved dearly, he was sorting their lives out for us. He wants to do the same for us. He wants us to live in close communion with one another as well as with him. As close as we should be to each other. In the early church, in Acts 2, 42, the church is just forming. The church is just coming together. Believers, uh, and they're being impacted by the world around them who don't understand and don't want to know and don't, don't want to be helpful. But it says the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They fellowship with one another. It's hard. I'm a British man. Sharing with others isn't something I find easily. Having fellowship isn't something that naturally comes to me. But that's what we're being provided with. Devoting ourselves to the Apostles' teaching, to fellowship together, to share with one another to be understanding of one another's needs, to be open and honest with one another. A compassionate love is a close love. You see, uh, those of us who know God as our loving Heavenly Father appreciate that we can freely approach him with confidence. It doesn't matter what your family background is, it doesn't matter how your relationship with your dad is, some of us have to wipe that out of our minds as we think about the possibility of a relationship with a dad who listens and cares and is compassionate to us, that we can be close to. James 4, Verse 8, the first part, to make that's clear. It says, come near to God and he will come near to you. That might not be an experience we, we know from our family lives. That might not be something we've experienced before. But if we come close to him, he comes close to us. He reveals himself to us. He longs for us to invite him in. We have for a heavenly father who, who just wants us to be close. Not a heavenly father who rejects us, reminds us of all those wrong things we do, reminds us that we haven't been there for a while, reminds us of all the things we haven't done, not the things we have done. 1 John 1 7 says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies from us from all sin. We, we can't do it in our own strength. We can't leave the church thinking, I'm going to be the person that everybody would like me to be. I'm going to be everybody's best friend. And I'm going to, do real, I'm going to work really, really hard to meet the needs of those around me. Unfortunately, that won't last. We'll have a few rebuttals. Things won't go just the way we want them to. We'll have issues. God calls us into his love and his care and his 
compassionate. And he understands that we're going to blow it. He understands that we're not going to get it right all the time. And he still loves us. Loves us so much that he sent Jesus for us. But compassionate love is comforting. Compassionate love is comforting. In our relationships with one another, we can bring God's comfort to one another, as Rebecca did for Isaac. Back in Genesis 24, 67, Isaac brought her into his tent, into the tent of his mother, Sarah. He married Rebecca. So she became his wife and he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. It, it's a picture of a relationship that works. It's a picture of a moment in time when love meet, met the needs that these people had. He married, his wife, his mother died and his wife was the comfort that he needed at that time. God's comfort is like the re comfort that Rebecca brought, brought to Isaac in his difficult time. In Job 16 we're shown two opposite ends of comfort. Job 16.2 it says, I've heard many things like these. You are miserable comforters, all of you. It's not very exciting. It's not very, um, um, it's not very thankful, is it? Later on, a few verses later, he says, but my mouth would encourage you. Comfort from my lips bring you relief. Job has experienced what the wrong end of the comfort stick is. The harsh, the pull yourself together, the get up and get on with it. But he says, there's comfort that you can have. My mouth will encourage you. Comfort from my lips will bring you relief. And of course in the much loved and well known Psalm 23 it tells us these things even though I walk through the darkest valley I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me compassion comes at us in all sorts of different ways but compassion is what we desire as human beings. It's what we need as human beings. It's what we have to have to be human beings. As musicians come, let's uh, just bow our heads and think about what we've heard and, and how it fits in. So as we close, as they watched, as Jesus watched both uh, Mary and John, he saw that they had those same needs. And those are the same needs that you and I have for compassion in our lives. And human beings are a great place to find that compassion and can often meet our need for that compassion, but ultimately, Ultimately, the only way to satisfy our need for compassion is the Lord Jesus Christ in what he did for us. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12 says, For I know that we dealt eat with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom, into his glory.